Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, another edition of a Sin Hardware Tech in 10. Today, we're going to deal with the Z87X-OC. This is Gigabyte's Enthusiast Z87X-OC. Um, so this is not the Z87X-OC Force, the one you saw with the water cooling and the fans and the 16-phase VRM. Instead, this is the $200 Z87X-OC. At least that's its launch price. This is for socket LGA 1150. You can tell by the new Core I inside stickers, and this is a chipset sticker. I think for two reasons Intel changed the sticker. Number one, to designate that this is a totally different platform than LGA 1155. Number two, to designate a new type of CPU. Now, Haswell is much different than most of the enthusiast CPUs before it for two reasons, uh, for, for one big reason, and that is that's built from the mobile up. Now, all the other platforms, such as um, LGA. Uh, 1366, that was built from the, those chips were server chips that were gimped, and they were gimped and sold to the public. I think Sandy and Ivory were kind of the same thing. Um, however, Haswell is different. It's built from the bottom up, and that means better power efficiency with the FIVR. Some people call it the FIVR. Uh, I prefer FIVR, or IVR for short. Um, and then it has a lot better uh, chipset. The chipset here has a lot lower TDP, which means it runs cooler. It also has a lot more connectivity and a lot more integration to the chip as well. For instance, all the video outputs, all the digital ones at least, come from the CPU now. Anyway, so let's take a look at the board. First, the box, right? So we can zoom out a little bit here and take a look at the box in its entirety. Uh, nothing too fancy. It's a normal ATX type style box. Um, now we can see the back. Tons of OC features. OC Touch is detailed with all the new features and all the old features um, talking about a new IR digital power design now there are a few things I want to talk about that are brand new alright and they're pretty cool first of all Gigabyte has added extremely extremely nice fan support to this board see so you have eight fan headers I believe uh, six of them are controllable or you have six settings in the BIOS and in Windows and one of those settings actually controls two headers so that's pretty cool you also have 15 uh, micron gold-plated CPU, memory, and PCIe power sockets um, and slots. Uh, so the socket's gold-plated, uh, so is this and these. Um, but also the 24-pin power connector has gold-plated pins, as does the 8-pin um, plus 4-pin extra power for the CPU. Now, gold is not doesn't corrode at all, and that's an excellent feature, especially when you're doing LN2 and you have multiple hot and cold cycles, especially with condensation. You know that stuff won't corrode on this board because it's gold-plated, for God's sakes. Anyways, it also comes with um, OC Brace. OC Brace is able to keep your GPUs in place even if you don't use a bench. However, it can also be used as a motherboard stand. Many people refer to it as a motherboard stand. And we also have a new heatsink design. This is a very minimalistic heatsink design, and that's awesome for one reason. So you can take off the VRM heatsink and the PCH heatsink if you really need to, but usually you just want to take off the VRM heatsink, put some grease on it or whatever, or insulate around it or on it, and that'll work fine. Or you can put it, leave it on. But also, this heatsink won't obstruct any big coolers, um, so it's pretty easy to insulate around, and I think that was the point. You also have new capacitors Gigabyte's putting on. Now, these are 10K hour, and they're um, polymer capacitors, solid, and uh, they're from uh, Chemicon, and that's a Japanese company, and these are have 10K hours at something like 105 degrees Celsius, which is very, very good, and the top of the line that's used on a motherboard these days. So that's awesome. We also have the IR power stages, which you've seen before in some of my reviews. So anyways, let's flip this baby over, open it, and do a little unboxing and quick review. First of all, we have the board. Uh, just very simple packaging, right, in anti-static. First, we'll take a look at the accessories, though. Okay, so let's start out with the manual. All right, so we have our ultra durable manual here. We have a driver DVD, um, and then we have a multilingual installation guide in case you don't know how to build a computer, which I hope you do if you're buying this board. Um, if you're not, I mean, it's the same thing as another board. But uh, this is kind of geared towards Extreme OC, and so a lot of the features, if you're just getting into building, you might not use. So maybe a UD3H or UD4H would be better for you. Anyways, so here we have four... SATA cables. These are all 6 gigabytes per second because all the SATA ports on this board are 6 gigabytes per second, which is also known as Revision 3. Um, each one of these packages has one header that's uh, slanted and 90 degrees, and that makes for better, uh, better looking cable management. So we have two uh, two-way bridges. One is for SLI and the other is for Crossfire. 
we have the OC Brace packaging here. Now, OC Brace is unique to Gigabyte, and you can even see the Gigabyte name here. This is custom made for this board, and the OC Force has it as well. Anyway, so one of these and one of these, there's two of these, and these hook up to the board. This one's a little higher than this, so the board sits right here, and the PCB is kind of sandwiched in between these two. And then you have another connector or brace here, and that'll go on the top, and you'll screw into it and it, all the screws are included, even the screws to screw in your GPUs here. This is excellent because a lot of people do out of the case benching and when you do out of the case benching, especially with this motherboard, sometimes your GPUs can sway side to side and they might damage the PCIe socket or the GPU itself. So this will keep it, this will keep it in place, however it can also be used as a stand for the motherboard, which I think is pretty cool. We also have a back panel IO shield. Um, Audio is all connected. You can also see what's included, right? Six USB 3.0 ports. You also have PS slash 2, which I use a lot. One uh, Intel NIC. You have SPDIF out. Uh, ALC 892, and I be 892, I believe. OC ignition button. We'll talk about this a little later. HDMI display port, HDMI, and then two USB 2.0 ports, which are awesome if you don't want to use USB 3.0, which I usually don't use. Then we have all these little uh, probes. And uh, these can plug into the voltage read points on the motherboard, and you can just stick probes into these back uh, little sockets. And these actually can stretch on one end, so it can fit a different variety of probe sizes, which is excellent. Um, you can also just use your probe directly to the board because it has leads on it. However, if you just want to set and forget, then you can use these. And it's nice that they include a lot of them. This will fill, fill all the voltage read points, and this board has a lot. And then we ended off with a Gigabyte sticker. All right. So if you want to add some bling bling to your system or bench, you can do that. Okay. So we put the board, I mean the box aside, and now we'll take a look at the board. So board comes in standard anti-static packaging. Now this packaging isn't bad. It's actually pretty good. Uh, it does a job. You don't need anything too special like a box for the board like the OC Force has. So this is the motherboard. Now the Z87X-OC is a really kind of top of the line, however not extremely top of the line board. As you notice in the corner here, we have only a few SATA ports and this is important to notice because these are all native from the PCH, meaning that there are no third party SATA controllers on this board. There are also no part, third party USB controllers on this board. There is however one USB 3.0 hub that provides some extra ports. And that's not that bad. That's actually something good. So we'll do a basic overview of the board like I usually do. Um, first of all, we'll take a look at the VRM. The heatsinks are a little loose because I've loosened them up already. So first, let's zoom in on the VRM. All right. Zoom out a little bit so we can get the PWM in the shot as well. All right. So here we have an IR3563B. Now the IR3563B is actually uh, uh, 8 plus 0 phase PWM. Now this 8 plus 0 phase PWM, this is the B revision. On the UP7 for instance, they use the A revision. The B revision allows for up to 2 MHz switching frequency per phase. The highest I've ever seen put on a motherboard. However, this motherboard would definitely not be running at that. It's just a possibility in case you want to do like phase doubling and stuff like that. That means you can have a higher per phase switching frequency at maximum because doublers divide the switching frequency in half. But here, you can actually do up to 2 megahertz per phase if the board makers would allow it, which they don't, which is a good thing because you'd probably kill your board. Anyways, so let's put some light on this area. So here we have 8-pin power connector, and remember these are gold-plated. On the inside you can kind of see the gold. And there's an extra 4-pin right over here, and this extra 4-pin will provide extra power. Now you can see this heatsink is a little uh, wobbly, and that's because I did loosen the screws on the back. Anyways, we can see eight phases here, right? Two, four, six, eight. These are the 60 amp chokes that were used on the UP boards from the last generation. Uh, they're extremely high capacity. Then we have those special black capacitors I talked about earlier. We have a two, four, six, eight, um, maybe nine of them, and they're each about 560 microfarads. Around the socket, we also have uh, three uh, fan ports. And uh, this is CPU fan, CPU optional fan, and then system fan one. These are all our system fan six. These are all controllable through the BIOS and software. Here we have the socket, which is gold plated, which is pretty nice. And now we'll move down to OC touch because OC touch is something that's very worthwhile. Uh, it's something you should get to know on this board because you're buying it basically for OC touch and the BIOS and the performance, of course, right? So, first, 
we'll start right here, the postcode display. Now, some people don't like this location because it's right between the DIMMs and the uh, the PCIe power, I mean, the general power for the board, and it's not too bad. I mean, most of the time you won't really need to look at it. If you do, you can just like kind of glimpse at it. I think Haikuki, when he does his memory benching, he actually puts a pen in there with the towels around it, and he's able to like just get a glimpse of the code. Uh, it's the one thing I don't like about the placement of the things on this board. However, there's really nothing we can do about it. Um, as an end user, but there is something we can actually do as an end user. We can actually solder to the back of the board. Um, I think Haikuki did this in one of his Facebook posts, and he actually took another, he bought one of these uh, LED postcodes, or took it from another board or something, and just soldered a bunch of IDE cables to the back, and just basically made a copy of this, so it came out, came out here, right? So you can do whatever you want with it. Let's go over some of the buttons, because they're really interesting. First, we have tag. Now, tag is one of these hold down buttons. So you press it down, it goes in, you press it up, it disengages. When you engage tag, it will load a profile that the user sets in BIOS. That means everything you set in BIOS profile, you can save them. There are eight profiles you can save in the BIOS. And tag is one of those, is a last profile and actually says tag next to that profile. Now, tag is really cool because of one reason. You can load your profile and then you can basically disengage it. So if you want to do LN2 benching and you just have a basic boot up profile, you can save that to tag. You can clear CMOS and whatever and tag profile will still be saved and you can just engage it again and you don't have to re-put all your settings. There's also a turbo button on here for overclockers who don't want to like mess around. Easy 4.2 gigahertz overclock. A gear button here can change between these base clock buttons. This plus adds one megahertz and this minus subtracts one megahertz from the base clock. Gear, however, will allow you to increase or decrease the base clock by 0.1 megahertz instead of 1 megahertz. These over here are plus and minus buttons next to power, and these do multiplier increase and decrease. Power button here. This is a PCIe disable switch, so you have four PCIe slots on this motherboard, right? And this little, uh, these little switches here will disable or enable them, which is pretty handy during LN2 overclocking, or if you have a water-cooled system, then it's really easy to use those to disable the slots to see if anything has a problem. Any GPU has a problem, sorry. Now we'll go down to this white button and then go left. The white button is a reset button and it's white so you can tell the difference between this one which is actually the clear CMOS. So the white button is a reset. Here we have a special new button called MemSafe and this is Gigabyte MemSafe and this will take you to fail safe memory boot up. So you can just press MemSafe and the board will automatically boot safely into, wind uh, into the BIOS. Well, it won't boot directly into BIOS but it will boot with safe memory settings, all right? Now this means that it'll take away memory as an issue when overclocking. Now in the middle we have a direct to BIOS button. Once you press this button, whether it's in Windows, whether it's in BIOS, or whether the power, or whether the system is on but powered, but I mean off but powered, then next time you boot up, it'll go directly into the BIOS. Next to it we have a settings lock button. Now settings lock is an interesting thing. So if you press settings lock and you boot up, it'll boot to your last best settings. So what does this mean? This means if you fail to overclock and you clear the CMO, settings lock still has those settings retained because of a chip that was added on here called EC. Now EC is called an embedded controller and it's something that ROG has been using, ROG has been using for a while to add some of those extra ROG features. And on this board it actually has its own BIOS and that BIOS is used to save profiles and that's why tag will still work even after you clear CMOS. That's also why settings lock will work and also it kind of lets the board have a secondary BIOS system where it kind of thinks for itself. Here we have a single BIOS uh, mode switch. So right now it's in dual BIOS mode. That means that the main and backup BIOS will check each other. However, when you're recovering from overclocking, that, couldn't be a, that can be a problem. So you can switch to single BIOS mode and it'll forego those problems. Now those problems aren't major problems. Sometimes you'll see an error on the postcode that says DB. DB error means dual BIOS error. And this usually comes up when trying to recover from a bad base clock overclock or something really, a bad overclock that messes the board up can really screw with the BIOS systems. And uh, setting it to single BIOS mode will help speed past the recovery and boot right up into the BIOS. If you have an issue, you can just switch back to dual BIOS mode and dual BIOS will kick back in. So if a BIOS corrupt, you can just switch back to dual BIOS mode and it will recover. However, if you just want to switch between BIOSes, you have a dual BIOS switch right in the center here. So you can just switch between main and backup. That's already been covered on a lot of other my, of my reviews. Here we have a trigger switch. Um, this is known as a slow mode on the ROG boards 
and uh, all the other manufacturers have added this as well. But Gigabyte's UP7 also had this from the last generation. This will switch between high and low. So right now, whatever multiplier I set, it'll be at. However, on the fly, I can switch to the other side and it'll take my multiplier down to 8x, a fail-safe mode. On the fly, in Windows, or even in BIOS, it'll work. At 8x, if I press plus on the multiplier, it'll actually increase the multiplier behind the scenes. So let's say I was at uh, 4 gigahertz, 40x, and I went down to 8x. Now if I press plus, I'm still at 8x. However, if I switch back to full mode, I'll be at 41x. That's pretty cool, right? So you can go and go down to 8x, press up multiplier, and then go real quick, try to get a validation, and take the frequency back down. Let's say you just val uh, you just pass a benchmark like 3D Mark 5 and you want to save the screenshot. Something that's kind of hard to do when you run a 3D benchmark and you're not sure how a stable system is. You want to go down to a lower frequency really quick so you can basically load up all the CPU-Zs and the GPU-Z and uh, basically take a screenshot. So you can go to 8x and you can push back up to whatever frequency you're at and take the screenshot. And then we have clear CMOS, of course. Then we have tons of voltage read points. Um, See, we have a bunch of V-Core readings, like four V-Core readings. We also have VC, V-In V reading. V-In is the power that the voltage regulator on the motherboard gives to the CPU. And then these V-Core readings and all the other readings are the voltages. And there's also PCH readings. But the other readings are voltages that the FIVR inside the CPU gives the different domains, such as the ring bus, uh, which is... The ring voltage is actually the cache voltage, and then you have a uh, CPU PLL analog and CPU PLL digital, and um, or CPU IO digital, CPU IO analog, and those are actually CPU PLL components. And then you have a system agent, which is basically your IMC, your memory controller. Moving along, we have the gold plated 24 pin, right? So you can see inside they're gold plated. And then we also have a USB 3.0 slot. There are two chips here. They're tiny. You can barely see them. They actually provide power to each of the outputs on the USB 3.0. Each header can do two, right? And this needs on-off charge capability. So that means when the system's off, it should also be able or off but still powered. Um, so basically, it's hooked up to the PSU. The PSU is on, but the system's off. This will still be able to charge your USB devices at higher speeds, and you can choose whether to do data transfer or not. And these little two chips made by TI actually allow that to happen. I forget the name right off the bat. Let's move on to some other cool features. Remember, I said the six SATA ports are all from Intel. So these are all SATA 60 gigabytes per second revision 3.0. That's great. No third-party controllers. All the SATA you probably need on this board. Here we have OC Connect. Now this feature is pretty cool. This feature allows you to plug in devices into here. These are USB 3.0 ports internally. Okay, they're provided directly from the PCH. No issue. And um, they basically allow you to. Well, they might not be directly from the PCH. They might be from somewhere else. Let me take a look at this board when I take the heatsink off, and I'll tell you. Anyways, USB 3.0 ports, and these two USB 3.0 ports, you can just internally stick a USB uh, stick in there, or you can charge your phone, or you can use a mouse or a keyboard. Then we have a button here called CBAT. CBAT is really interesting. Okay, CBAT is a special button developed in case you don't, if in case you have GPUs installed and you cannot remove your battery. So removing the battery really helps clear the CMOS and um, you want to discharge everything. Well, CBAT will do that. In, in fact, if you have the power supply plugged in while you press CBAT, you won't be able to start up until you unplug the power supply's 24 pin connector and then plug it back in. Then you can boot up. CBAT is that powerful. What CBAT does is it sends a signal to your power supply that there has been a short on the motherboard or in the system. And it sh puts your power supply in a fail safe shutdown mode where it drains all the power from your motherboard. By doing so, it'll clear the CMOS as well. And that's handy in case clear CMOS doesn't go well, which it seems not to do with Intel's latest generation. Then we have the dual BIOS LEDs right here, so this will tell me if I'm using my main or my backup BIOS which is pretty nifty. It's some place you can actually see because the BIOSes are right up here. They're a little hidden and you might not be able to see those either. So that's handy. Um, you also have another USB 3.0 header here, I believe, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so this is not run off Intel. Neither is this. They're actually run off a chip right up here, which is a hub. That's what I was looking for, this extra port. So most of this is native. Um, I don't think they added extra chips for connectivity here at all. So let's keep taking a look at this board, right? So let's zoom out a little bit. Okay, so you can see the GPU layout, right? You have four PCIe slots. So you're thinking, damn, can I do a four-way SLI? And the answer is, no, nah, you can't. And that's for one reason. There's no PLX bridge chip on here, right? You don't see one, right? You don't see an extra heat sink to cool almost eight watts, right? And that's because it isn't there. 
Now, the native Haswell chip actually has 16x PCI 3.0 lanes. Those lanes are distributed through one, two, and three slots, right? The first three slots are have those lanes. This last slot is a hardwire 4x slot, directly gets its bandwidth from this um, PCH. Okay, and this is PCI 2.0. Now, this is PCI 3.0. This is PCI 3.0, this is 3 PCI 3.0. The bandwidth, however, differs than what you think. Usually they do 16x, 8x, 4x. However, on this board, to give huge spacing between slots, this will do 8x and this will do 8x, right? And this will do 16x normally. Then, if you want to do three-way, you plug another GPU in here, this will do 8x, 4x, 4x, okay? And then if you want to do four-way crossfire, you can actually do that at 8x, 4x, 4x, 4x. However, SLI cannot work at this kind of bandwidth. SLI can only work at 8x, 8x, and thus these two can give you 8x, 8x, which is not bad. The whole board has the black capacitors, which is pretty nice. Up here, we have extra PCIe power. Now, you're wondering why it's not the normal SATA connector you see on gigabyte boards, and that's because there just wasn't room on this side to fit them in. Okay? And then we have a two-phase memory voltage regulator here from when we made with power packs. It's also digital, and that might be important later on down the road because memory overclocking is really awesome on these boards, especially this board. This board is actually known for having some of the best overclocking on Z87. You know, take another board, put the same chips in both, and see which one clocks higher. I dare you. Anyways, so, let's go over the back panel. First of all, we have an ALC892, and that supports something like 7.1. So here we have those audio outputs, SPDIF optical for that. Then we have a RJ45 LAN port, and this is powered by the Intel NIC. Then we have six USB 3.0 ports, and um, these are all powered by Intel, except uh, these four are off a uh, hub. And then we have PS slash 2 from the Super I.O., like normal. Here we have a special switch called OC Ignition. OC Ignition is really, really cool. Now, if you press this in a little bit, it engages. OC Ignition was really hard to engineer, okay? OC, engin OC Ignition can actually provide power to the board components, however, not actually start up the system. That means that you can keep the fans running, all the lights on, as well as the even the GPU fans running and the PCIe ports powered however the CPU won't start the RAM won't have power going to it or anything like that so the system is actually off but some power is being given to certain components for one reason uh, when you're doing LN2 benching right maybe you don't want to get everything messed up uh, and that means condensation well one way to prevent condensation is to have constant airflow and having constant airflow can be provided by fans, however, when you cold bug, which you will, you will on Haswell, you can't do that. The fans will shut off with the system because the power supply will be off. This will keep the power supply on. And that also comes in handy. Kind of think about it, right? You're a water cooler, right? You want to test your pump outside the system running. So a lot of people like to jump their power supplies. Well, this is actually a jump for the power supply as well. So this will keep the power supply loaded safely, and that was the hard part to engineer. Keeping the power supply loaded safely while not having the system on. Well, not having the system on. Well, Gigabyte was able to engineer this, and that's pretty cool. So, this is OC Ignition. I think you'll only find it on Gigabyte. Okay, so now let's move over to USB 2.0 ports. These are USB 2.0 directly from Intel PCH. They're very useful installing, for installing the OS and for other things such as that. Because this is native, doesn't require drivers or anything, even in XP, where USB 3.0 actually isn't supported by Intel. Actually, none of this platform is supported by Intel, but you can install the Mi and INF drivers for Windows 7 in XP. Anyways, here we have a HDMI port. Here we have a secondary HDMI port. Now I asked them why the heck do you have two HDMI ports and I actually got an answer finally. And the answer was that they're both outputs, however some people might want HDMI output as audio and as um, video on another one. So this can give out the same output. One can be audio, one can be digital, I mean one can be video. Then we have a display port connector here for those of you who love it. Anyways, so we'll go to the back of the board. It's a six layer PCB, which is optimal for the memory overclocking in this series. Alright, so let's remove these screws and go over some of the chips. So the screws I've already loosened up for myself, so it's easy for me to do this for you. Easy peasy. Okay, so six screws, all of them high quality, and you saw how easy everything comes off. Notice there's no crazy um, thermal paste on the PCH. That's because the PCH is only about 4.1 watts. That's really low. 
Um, it's much lower than the 6.7 watts on the Z77, and that is because of a new node process. I think it's 32 nanometers. Then we have the uh, simple VRM heatsink. This is actually all you need to cool the heatsink. Actually, you probably don't even need this. You can run it on air without it. Um, that's how good these new power stages are, which we actually saw on previous platforms. So, here we see the IR3553. These can each support 40 amps of power, and uh, they're more than enough to power any scenario the Haswell CPU can, will be in. And we see 60 amp chokes to not limit them. We already went over the PWM, right? Anyways, we already went over some of the other chips, but um, I kind of want to go over some other stuff. So, we have a secondary PWM. Um, where did it go? Here. This is an IR. Let me zoom. Okay. This is an IR3570. The IR3570 is a 3 plus 2 phase PWM. This provides power to the uh, memory VRM powered by our IR3598, which is a doubler slash dual driver. Here it's just being used as a dual driver to power the phases for the memory VRM. However, it is also powering some phases for the PCH as well. You can see it's a new node. You can see it's totally different than the Z87 one. It, there's nothing even written on the chip itself. Moving over along the base, we can see here, this is the ITE chip. I think it's 8790E. There's no data sheet on this because it's a customized chip just for Gigabyte. Here you can see this other chip here. Now this is this BIOS that's actually labeled EC BIOS. I don't see where it's labeled on this board. It's actually really small. You can't see it. Then we have the main and backup BIOSes. These BIOSes are actually 16 megabytes, 128 megabits, much larger than before. We have a clock generator for the PCIe right here. Then we have a uh, NEC slash Renaissance hub. I think this is called a D... Uh, 720210. It's a brand new super speed hub, 4 to 1. So the PCH is giving one port to here, which is dividing it into 4, which goes here and here. Um, and then it's also providing another port here, which goes to these two up here. Uh, so these hubs can give a total of 8, and the PCH has 2 more. Um, so it's a total of 10. So these actually should be USB 2.0 ports. Uh, but it's their label is USB 3. I think it's a little mis uh, label on the motherboard. Uh, yeah, my bad. Anyways, so let's look at some of the other chips. Okay, that's a hub here and that's the hub here. Anyways, we also have here, we have uh, six of these PCI 3.0 uh, little slots, I mean chips. And these chips are what switches the bandwidth between this slot. So four of them will switch the bandwidth down here for 8x, 8x. And then these other two will take 4x from here and switch it here for 8x, 4x, 4x, okay? And we'll come over here. And here we have an IT8892E. 8892E. This provides uh, two PCIe slots from one PCIe express lane. We have an IT8728F right here. This is the typical Super IO you see. This Super IO plus this EC provides uh, all the awesome fan support. You see all the headers all over the board, right? So one here, we saw three up in the Nexus CPU. Uh, so that's one, two, three, four. And five, six, seven, and then there's one here for eight. Okay, here we have a Realtek codec. I think this is ALC eight nine two. Nothing special, nothing fancy. However, they did, did a decent job of sending the analog signals on this side and all these capacitors just for the audio. Here's a front audio output. Here we have an Intel NIC that works with the Intel. Actually, this is an Intel PHY that works with Intel NIC integrated into the motherboard. Uh, Realtek codecs are actually uh, a Zilla codecs that work with. Intel's HD audio, so all of them, even Realtek ALC 1150 also works with the integrated Intel audio. So they're just codecs, that's why they're not like Core 3D, which actually uses a PCIe lane and gives you some better performance. Alright, so that almost covers all the chips, and then we have two more here. These are NXP uh, PCIe switches, um, or uh, HDMI level shifters, and they provide the two HDMI ports from digital display. Anyway, so that about finishes our review. I hope you enjoyed our little glance at the Z87X-OC. Uh, thanks for looking, and next time we'll have a nicer board for us to look at. All right? Thank you, and hope you watch again.